I just turned it on. <laughs> All right. We, okay. We on? All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to those who are watching by live stream tonight. And uh, it's been, seems like it's been a while since we've been together and uh, with bad weather and everything else. So it's good to be back. Uh, we continuing on through our, through the Bible uh, overview of each book and how it relates to the entire Bible. And so before we get into it tonight, I do want to recognize and make a special uh, word of thanks and gratitude to Miss Emily Walden. She has been working now. She's our communication specialist, and uh, she has really been working on improving things. And, uh, and we got fiber. We got a fiber line started. So hopefully that's going to make a big improvement with our uh, technology and communication and live streaming. So uh, I just want to say a special word of thanks to Emily. She's done a super job. And she's also our VBS director. So she's very, very busy right now. So uh, we appreciate her so very, very much in the work she's doing. Okay. Well, can anybody tell me what the theme of our overall study is? Have you memorized it yet? <laughs> Good deal. Well, y'all have got it. And that's the story of the Bible. Going back and looking at how God has put together and planned, and it, it was a plan. Things just didn't happen and God react. That's what we do. You know, as life happens, then we react and respond. God had a specific plan. The Scripture says even before the foundations of the world were formed, Christ was already slain in the heart and mind of God. So God has been active, and He is active at work even today and throughout all of history because this is His plan. Now, there may be some things that will take place that look, well, that kind of threw things out of whack. But sometimes, and we have to remember that there's two type of wills. There's God's permissive will, and then there's God's divine will. God has given to all human beings the ability to say no to Him. Man has free will. And many times man chooses not to recognize, not to honor, not to respect, not to follow, not to obey God and His instruction. And so sometimes... Man makes bad choices, but here's the beauty of it. God in His, in his sovereignty and in His power and in, in His omniscience is able, as the old fellow said, to take a lemon and turn it into lemonade. That's the beauty of what God can do. Man can try to thwart. Satan tried. He's been trying. He's still doing it, trying to thwart the will of God. But God, even at times it appears that Satan may get a victory, God can turn it around and he can work it out for good. Remember what Joseph told his brothers. You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. So I know when things happen and when difficulties happen, we go, man, I just don't understand. God, why did you allow this to happen? Just stop and rest because it very well may be that God is going to do something special in your life through that experience. So just hold on. And that's one of the lessons we're learning as we're going through this section of the historical books. Now, today, uh, we're going to begin this, to look at the second of three double books in the Old Testament. We looked at First and Second Samuel, and now we're looking at First Kings. And in the Hebrew Bible, originally, First and Second Kings was one book. Now, the author of this is unknown. Uh, there's a lot of speculation. Some have suggested Ezra, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Some have even said it could have been a compilation of temple records and from other writings. As a matter of fact, um, you, if, if you've read through 1 Kings, you will find that it even refers to several different writings of different uh, individuals like the the book of the Acts of Solomon, the book of Chronicles uh, is mentioned. And so it could have been that they compiled a lot. So we don't know who the exact author is, but it is giving a historical backdrop of what has been taking place. Now, the date for the 
book of 1 Kings is approximately about 971 to 853 and possibly was written around 586, which is a significant date that we'll see in just a moment. So as we come to 1 Kings, David is still living, but then he dies uh, in the second chapter. And so uh, we find that, that uh, David's reign as king has now come to an end. Second Samuel really looked at, at uh, David's reign, but when we come to 1 King, now we're going to see the death of David, and we're going to see um, we're going to see the next king, who is Solomon. Now the name Solomon means peace. That's interesting, considering he was a child of Bathsheba, and that was not a peaceful uh, start in their relationship. If you remember the story, uh, David. Uh, she was another man's wife, and he committed adultery with her, and that baby died. She became pregnant, and that baby died. But then after they got married, they had another son, and his name is Solomon, which means peace. Now, he rules over Israel for 40 years. And so now, the covenant that God had made with David, Solomon is the first one now to carry on the covenant that God made with David. And an interesting thing to note, he is the last king to reign over a united kingdom of the Jews. Okay? And um, so as we come now to look at 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then as we look at First and Second Chronicles, just something to kind of help us to remember and have a foundation, you'll see on your notes there, Israel is referred to as the northern kingdom, ten tribes, and its capital was Samaria. Uh, it wasn't the original capital, but it does then become the capital of the northern kingdom. Judah is the name of the southern kingdom, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and the capital of Judah was Jerusalem, where the temple was. Now, next week, when we look at 2 Kings, we're going to see the collapse and the captivity of both kingdoms as they fall. But right now, we're going to look at 1 Kings, so we're going to look at Solomon's life and his reign uh, through the majority of, or well, through the first part of this book. Okay? Now, two key verses that I find here. In 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 3, David gives a charge uh, to Solomon. And he says, To keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Now, God had also told that to David. Of course, we know David became king and he was successful and God blessed him and God used him and he was a good king at times, but then he had failures and he messed up. So as he is now at the end of his life and is charging his son Solomon, he reiterates these words, and these words we need to read all the time for us even today. That we must keep the charge of the Lord our God, to obey Him, to walk in His ways. Because that's the one thing we, we've remembered. God has promised, if you follow me, if you obey me, if you trust me, if you keep my word, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't, you're not going to have the blessing. And you're going to have disaster and difficulty. So as Moses, or I mean as David, even refers to this is what God told Moses. And this is what God told David. And now David is passing this on to his son. And then it's interesting in, in chapter 3, verse 9, God appears to Solomon, remember, and he asks him, what do you want? Have you ever stopped and thought about if God came to you and said... Scott, what do, you, what do you want? Suppose God came to you and just said, Ed, what do you want? What do you want? What kind of answer would we give? I think this is a, 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 an interesting verse that we find as Solomon responds to God's asking questions. Most time we're asking questions of God, right? But God asked Solomon, and says, what do, you, what do you want me to do for you? This is what he said. 
Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? That's an interesting answer to a question that God asked. I can't help but think there would be a lot of people who say, Lord, give me all the money. Give me all the power. Give me all the ability. Let me, let me have it all. Solomon, when presented with the opportunity, says, I just want wisdom. I want understanding. Look at that where he says, give your servant an understanding heart. How, how significant and how important is that? Well, considering what's going to happen in Solomon's life, he definitely needed it. And he used it for a while. He just didn't stick with it. But hey, let's not give him a hard time. We've been guilty of the same thing, haven't we? So those are, those are the two key verses that I find. Now here's a basic outline of 2 Samuel. Uh, chapters 1 and 2, we find the death of David. In chapter 1, we find that one of his sons, Adonijah, uh, he wants to become king. And so he kind of he gets some folks together, and, and so he's going to start doing that. But then the word gets to David of what he's doing, and and uh, that God or that David had promised to Bathsheba that Solomon would be king, and so uh, he kind of hurries along and anoints and and announces that Solomon is going to succeed him, and which he does. And then in chapters three through eleven, we find uh, the the reign of Solomon. Now here's what's interesting. Chapters 3 to 11 sums up Solomon's reign of 40 years. Doesn't seem like that's just a very long list of things that he did. But in them are some interesting things. Uh, chapters 3 and 4, we find where God has asked him uh, about what does he want. He asked for wisdom. And uh, you'll find in chapter 4, verses 29 through 32, that Solomon is also responsible for 3,000 Proverbs. That's why we say that Proverbs was written mostly by Solomon. Okay, He also wrote 1,005 songs. So he was very musically inclined. Then in chapters 5 through 8, we find him building the temple. Now again, in the history of God's plan... Solomon building the temple is probably one of the most significant points in the book of 1 Kings because of all that the temple represents. Uh, then in chapters 9 and 10, we find Solomon's fame where the word gets out and man, people are just amazed and, uh, of what's going on. Um, as a matter of fact, the Bible talks about that how every year he probably took in about $20 million annually from the people of the nation. And then in chapter 11, we find Solomon's downfall and his death. Now, ladies, do not get mad at me when I say this. But it says in chapter 11, he had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. And it says that they turned his heart from God. Well, I think by the sheer numbers, that was part of the problem, okay? Um, every wife wants to be number one, right? Just, just saying. Um, but what, and people have really wondered about this. How, how could he have 700 wives and concubines? A lot of these marriages were really political treaties just to keep peace. You see, under Solomon's reign, Israel grew to its largest expanse territorially. And many times it was because what Solomon did is he would make a treaty with one of the surrounding people or nations, and many times that was uh, uh, kind of solidified by marrying someone of the royal family. And so anyway, Solomon, maybe his intention was to just expand and try to keep peace for the people of God. 
but it literally then became his downfall. And because of that, then God takes the kingdom away from Solomon, and he's, gonna, he's going to uh, even divide the kingdom after Solomon's death. So now chapters 12 through 22 really talk about the division of the kingdom. Solomon's the last king to reign over a united kingdom. Now, in chapters 12 through 22, we find how the nation is divided. There are two different lines of kings now. You've got the northern kingdom. You've got the southern kingdom. Now, both were sons of uh, Solomon, and uh, they uh, are now going in two different directions. And so uh, you find that... that uh, these chapters now in the remainder part of 1 Kings are going to tell the story of, of the different kings for the two kingdoms. Yeah, Rehoboam was because he, he, ruled, over, he ruled over Judah. All right. Let me check again here real quick. All right, am I wrong? Somebody tell. Huh? Okay. So go to chapter 12 because that's where the uh, first kings. All right. Uh, little, little, little. All right, so Jeroboam, all right, um, all right, okay, I've lost my place here. Uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Okay. Okay. All right. I stand corrected. I apologize. Um, let me, was, was he mentioned in chapter one? And let's go back. When Adonijah, um, no, that was that was Joab. I thought. No, okay. No, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So he was the son of Nebat. I apologize. Okay, that's my second mistake today. I'm I'm not sure. I'd have to I'd have to study on that one, brother Earl. Okay, so, so then with the kingdoms divided now, the kings have lost their credibility in leading. And so now we find the emergence in chapter 17 through the rest of the book, chapter 22, of Elisha, the prophet, Elijah, the prophet who comes on the scene. And so this is a huge, this is a huge change. Now remember, Samuel was very significant to the kingdom. And then he was the one who anointed uh, Saul. And so now the king is the one who is the ruler. And, and so now with the kingdom split and the kings are going in every different direction, God raises up a prophet. And so the role of the prophet becomes a significant part of the history of God speaking to his people because the kings have failed so terribly. Now, if you'll look at your third page, here you'll find a little chart of the kings of both Judah and Israel. And so just some information there, uh, you will see that all of the kings in Israel are bad. 
And most of the kings in Judah were bad, although there are some good ones uh, along the way. And we'll look more uh, at some of the contrast of that in just a moment. Okay, so as we think about some of the key themes in this book, again, you, you've seen me list this over and over again, is the covenant. Because again, the covenant is significant in understanding all of the Bible. God made a promise. God made a covenant that He would be their God and that He would protect them and, and bless them and He would provide for them. But the kingdom many times surrendered that. They ignored that. They refused to accept that. But because of God's promise, He keeps coming back and forgiving and he, he demonstrates great patient, patience with them being so disobedient in all the things that God had commanded them to do. So that's a, that's a theme that runs all the way from Genesis through Revelation. How significant is that for us today? Do we need the encouragement of knowing God's covenant for us? That He will... He will still be with us even when we mess up. Hey, have any of you messed up? I did today on live stream. Okay, I can't escape that. That happens. Okay, but God is always there and He always, always will pick us back up if we'll ask Him to. And that's, that's the beauty of the covenant that God has made. And so the thing that, that people need to understand is when God makes a promise, He's going to keep it. And that's something that uh, you don't see a lot of today in this culture, okay? The second key theme that we find in this book, as we've seen in the book of Judges, is the destructiveness of sin. Now, Israel and Judah had a lot of problems, Israel more so than Judah, with idolatry. Uh, remember, as you read some, read some of the stories of, uh, of the people of Israel and Judah, they, they fell into idolatry over and over and over again. Matter of fact, Solomon did at the very end in chapter 11. You can read where he, be, he, he begins to raise up high places and altars for some of his wives' false gods. And so how could a man who had such wisdom from God fall and stumble so low. Well, we need to understand that idolatry is a dangerous and destructive thing. Now, what is an idol? Is it a piece of stone, piece of wood, piece of metal or precious jewel? It could be anything. It can even be a person. Hey, some people idolize themselves. I, I remember that song by, uh, what was it, Mac Davis? Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. You know, that's where a lot of people live. Oh, they, they idolize themselves. But then sometimes people will idolize their spouse. Some will idolize their children. An idol is anything that we put more attention and focus upon than we do God. And God made it very clear that there shall be no other gods before me. And so idolatry was a constant battle for the people of God. And that's what we battle with all the time, even today in our own lives. If we're not careful, we can spend more time in other things than in the things of God. And then if we do that, that becomes an idol. So the thing about Israel and Judah, they, they kept falling to the God's the, the false gods of, of some of their neighbors and some of the people that were living and dwelling with them. Now, what makes that so significant? Because in the book of Judges and in the book of Joshua, when they conquered the land, they didn't get rid of everybody like God told them to. And guess what? If you don't get rid of everything God tells you to get rid of, it'll come back and be a thorn in your flesh. And that's what happened to the people of God. Another key theme we find is the kingship and human failure. We saw it in Saul. We saw it in David. And now we see it in Solomon. 
And we begin to see it in all the other kings that followed them. So Solomon began well, but it ended in folly. Solomon's wisdom gave into human logic. That's a danger we all face. And then again, most kings of Israel and Judah were evil kings. So the reality of what this book teaches us is again the sinfulness of man. That nobody is perfect. And even with the best intentions, we still have difficulty trying to be faithful, trying to be righteous, trying to be faithful followers of the Lord. Now, I want to get into to some unique references here because we get several of these here in the book of 1 Kings. The first one is, what did you think about when you read about they laid hold of the horns of the altar? There were two different people who did that, Adonijah and Joab. Now, where was, where was the horns of the altar? Anybody know? It was on the altar of the burnt offering. Yeah. And so people had access to that. Now, what's significant about that they came in and grabbed hold of the horns of the altar was that if somebody had unintentionally maybe killed somebody or did some damage or hurt somebody really bad, if they could run and grab hold of the horns of the altar, they would be safe. Okay? And basically what that is, is they're claiming asylum is what they're doing. Okay? Now, Adonijah, remember, he grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. Why did he do it? Anybody remember? Well, because when David cor uh, 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 coronated Solomon to be his successor, Adonijah said, he's going to kill me. And so he ran, grabbed hold of the horns of the altar and stayed there and begged for his life. And Solomon said, okay, I won't kill you. And so he was able, able to leave. When Joab, who had kind of risen up to be with Adonijah, he comes and grabs hold of the horn of the altar. But remember, Joab had committed several murders. And Solomon actually winds up having him killed right by the horn of the altar. So that phrase, the horn of the altar, is very, it's, it's very unique. But it speaks about how that if a person is fearful for their life, if they, if they don't know where to turn, you can always run to the horns of the altar. And the altar of the burnt offering, the temple, the tabernacle, the place where the ark was, the place where that altar of sacrifice was, represented God. And so if a person would flee to God, they could find safety and they could find asylum there. So just an interesting reference there. Uh, in chapter 3, we find a unique story. One, as a, as a little boy growing up, I was always amazed at the story of Solomon when the two women came and they both claimed to be the mother of the baby. And you've heard that story. I mean, you know, that child's mine. The other one said, no, that child's mine. And so they come to Solomon and, well, who's right? And Solomon, with that godly wisdom that God gave him, said, okay, give me a sword. We'll cut the baby in half and each one of you can take half. And remember, the real mother said, no, don't do it. Let the child go with the other lady. And Solomon said, take the baby and give it to her because she loved her child. I always love that story. Just some wisdom about that. Now be careful in how you use that because some people have learned that story and they'll try to psychologically outwit you on that one. So, uh, but I, I always found that very, very unique. Now, another couple of things that I, I find very unique is the building of the temple. Uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 5. 1 Kings chapter 5. Because I think this is, this is really interesting to me. I've done construction work, and during my summers uh, when I was in high school, I helped build houses. And so um, it's always been intriguing to me on some of the um, construction and things uh, in the Scriptures. But in 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 15 uh, through 18, it says, Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains. 
besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the people who labored in the work. And the king commanded them to carry large stones, costly stones, huge stones to lay the foundation of the temple. So Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and the Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. Now, when you stop and think about a stone temple, they didn't have flatbed trailers and trucks. They didn't have dollies. They didn't have uh, forklifts. They carried those stones. And they had, and, you know, if you've ever looked at some of the history and some of the uh, possibilities of how they moved them, you know, on, on logs and then rolling, rolling the, the big stones, and then they would get the, the, the round uh, wood poles and they would move them around and, and roll the stones, and then sometimes they'd carry them. But can you, can you imagine all the work that had to be done to do that? But now here's the amazing thing. Look in chapter 6 and verse 7. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. Isn't that amazing? So... It was a perfect fit. It was a perfect fit. Now, think about this. They had to do all the finish work at the quarry and then bring it to the temple. The Yeah. 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 Does God take great interest in the things that are used or built to represent himself? Very much so. And so when you stop and think about all that had to be done and planned and then carried out so that not not a sound of a hammer or a chisel was heard in the temple. I mean, yeah, you heard the stones, you know, maybe setting up against the next one and, and the, maybe the voices of the workers, but every stone fit perfectly right from the quarry. That's, to me, that's, that's just a very amazing, amazing thing when you think about it. Now, when the temple is built in, in chapter 8, you will find in verse 11 that it talks about that after... Uh, Solomon had had, uh, had brought the ark in and the people had worshipped and, and celebrated that when the priest came out in verse 11, it, or in verse 10, it says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The Shekinah glory of God that filled the place. Now think about this. It was so thick, it was so massive that the, the priests couldn't even continue doing their work. Was God pleased with what had taken place? Yes. And he proved it by his glory filling that place. That's his presence. Now, this is not a this is not a good thing. This is uh uh, talking about Solomon's downfall in 1 Kings chapter 11, that if you go back, and I've given you this reference, Deuteronomy 17, 16, and 17, what would happen if a king did not follow God's instructions? And Solomon went down the opposite road of what God had even instructed Moses to tell the people of Israel. So you, you can go back and, and read that. 
Now, a couple of things that really stick out is what happens in chapter 12. After Solomon dies, now there's the split of the kingdom. Rehoboam is uh, going to lead the people of Israel, or I mean of, of uh, Judah, and Jeroboam is going to lead the people of Israel. And so here's what happened. And this is what, this is what was so sad uh, when it takes place. In verse 25 of chapter 12. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. He went out from there and built Penuel. Now Penuel was a place where it, it is believed that um, Jacob wrestled with the angel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, listen to this irony here. Is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Basically what he did was he gave them an alternative to what God had required of them. Notice verse 30. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship, before the one as far as Dan. Now, you need to remember, this is one of the most significant things about the division of the kingdom. Because Judah, the two tribes, the southern kingdom, Jerusalem was its capital. The ten tribes, the northern kingdom, they have a problem. If they follow what God had said, you've got to go to Jerusalem, then what they're doing is they're admitting They've got to go down to Judah. They've got to, they've got to go to the other kingdom. And he says, if we do this, the people's hearts are going to be turned to Judah. So he gave them an alternative. And that was the sin. And so that was a very significant thing. And so the battle raged between Israel and Judah over where to worship. Do you remember? You remember when Jesus met the woman at the well? She was a Samaritan. And remember, there was a discussion of where are we supposed to worship? Here or there? And Jesus said, if you're really going to worship God, you must worship Him in what? Spirit and in truth. So what you're seeing right here is the beginning of what's going to be that question when you come to the Gospel of John. So interesting, unique reference there. And then, of course, probably one of the most familiar things out of 1 Kings is chapter 18, where Elijah has the great contest with the prophet or the god Baal uh, on Mount Carmel. And uh, that's, a, that's a great story. Now, under that, you'll find that uh, I've kind of contrasted the two kingdoms and kind of the differences. Let me just note a couple of these things. You'll notice that the capital for the northern kingdom was Shechem, but then it was moved into Samaria, where the capital of Judah was Jerusalem. Now, there were seven different families of the kings of Israel, but the kings of Judah all came from one family, the family of David, okay? Now, all the kings of Israel were bad. Some of the kings of Judah were good, but most of them were bad. And then you'll see that the kings in Israel had shorter reigns. The kings in Judah had longer reigns. The kingdom of Israel... The northern kingdom lasted about 240 years, but the kingdom of Judah, southern kingdom, lasted through about 400 years. And then you'll see the dates where they fell to enemy nations. In Israel, the northern tribes, they fell in 722. 
and were taken, most of them were taken to Assyria by uh, Shalmaneser. And then Judah fell, 587, 586 BC, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, and many of them were taken to Babylon. And we'll learn more about that as we go through some of the prophets. Okay? So any questions on any of that so far? All right. Just some closing thoughts then. What are some lessons that we learn from this book as we think about, okay, why is this book so important? Well, it's a history of the nation of Israel. But here are some things we need to learn. Even the best intentions can't keep us from falling. Would you, would you agree with me that Solomon had good intentions? I mean, hey, when, he, when God said, what do you want? He could have asked for anything, and he asked for, for the best thing. Lord, just give me wisdom so that I know how to judge your people, how to rule your people. And remember, what did God give him because he asked for wisdom? Remember? What did it say? He gave him everything. He gave him everything else. Power, fame, money, popularity. And he said, because you didn't ask for these things, I'm giving it to you. Yeah. And uh, so even with the best intentions, though, Solomon stumbled. And listen, every one of us will do the same. We can have the best intentions, but if we're not faithful and we don't stick to it, even we can mess up. All right, number two, disobedience always brings division. Always, always, always. Number three, we need to remember this one. God allows even wicked rulers to reign. When we think about some of the things that are happening even today over on the other side of the world. Why would God allow some of these wicked rulers to rule? Well, again, God may very well be using them in His plan. You know what's interesting? Again, to mention that Ukraine is one of the most Christianized countries in all of Europe. So we should not be surprised that it's being attacked by a leader who does not believe in God. Isn't that the story <laughs> that's been going on for years and years and years and years in the Scriptures? God allows even wicked rulers to reign. Now here's an interesting thing to remember. Wicked kings can have godly sons and good kings can have wicked sons. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't make sense, but sometimes some of the best folks come from the worst circumstances and environments and then sometimes those who come from the most advantageous the most potential backdrop can turn out to be some of the wickedest meanest people in all the world but then lastly an important lesson to learn over and over we've seen it We've seen it with Moses. We've seen it with the children of Israel in the wilderness. We've seen it with Joshua and the, and, and the people of God as they were making conquest of the promised land. We saw it with the judges. We've seen it with David. We've seen it with Solomon. Over and over, God will renew and revive when we turn to Him. If there's any lesson that we need to learn from 1 Kings, it's this. We need to renew... We need to confess, we need to repent, and when we do, God can renew and revive us to be His representatives in this world. So, as we think about 1 Kings, man, there's a lot of information there, a lot of kings, a lot of ups and downs, but through it all, we learn that God is still faithful and He still has His hands on His people. Now, what we're going to find as we finish 2 Kings is both nations will fall and go into captivity. Is God done with His people? No. No. He will bring a portion of them back. And that's the story. It's the history of God's redemption for sinful man who sins, but that is renewed and changed and revived by what Jesus Christ did that we just celebrated last week. So, let 1 Kings be a good reminder to us. Stay faithful. 
stay obedient, ask for wisdom, and stay away from a lot of wives and husbands and concubines and porcupines and all those other things, okay? <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Well, let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for the book of 1 Kings. Thank you, Father, for the honest and open and transparent description of men and women, even in their failures. Lord, we look at Solomon and we see what wonderful potential, but then we see how just by some very bad decisions and allowing his heart to be turned, things just begin to fall apart. God, help us to realize that even in our life today, that we need to learn the lessons that others have experienced. That when we are disobedient, when we're not faithful, everything turns upside down. And Lord, we're living in a world that's upside down. But we know that if people will turn their hearts to you, if they will return to you, you can renew and you can revive and you can make lemonade out of some sour lemons. So God, help us to be people that can be change agents. Help us, Lord, to be witnesses. Help us to be examples of people that continue to faithfully trust you with our lives. Now, Lord, guide us through the remainder of this week. Give us a good night's rest. Lord, bless all those on our prayer list and those who are hurting. Give them strength. Give them, Lord, all that they need for your honor and for your glory. Now dismiss us in your grace and in your care. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. God bless you.